Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Mormon Kabbalah Podcast. This week we're getting back into chapter 33 of the Book of Remembrance, and it's interesting, when we look at the text here, I'm going to read part of verse 5 and part of verse 9. Verse 5 says, the second and third is hakma, wisdom. And then verse 9 says, the second and third is da'at, knowledge. I find it very interesting that the top of the right and left columns are both the second and the third. And yet, we start with hakma, wisdom. And so that's what we're going to be discussing today. So what is this saying? What does this mean? How can they both be second and third? I think this is saying that there is a oneness of the two columns at the top of each of the pillars, these right and left pillars. And that oneness is a part of the oneness of God. So if we're traveling, doing meditations on these sephirot, or walking the 32 paths, we include the Olivet in with this. I don't think that there's a wrong direction to go in here. It seems that if you're going to draw lines, if you're going to draw like, you know, take the tree of life as traditionally it is pictured and draw lines on it based on this chart, based on this chapter, I think you can very easily move from Peter to Hakma as we're going to do today. But because this says that both are the second and the third, I don't think that it would be wrong to go to Da'at instead. Rather, I think we need to understand that without wisdom, we can't do anything with the knowledge that we receive. And without knowledge, we can't necessarily understand the wisdom. These are two things that we need together. And there is no connection, direct connection, between them in the line other than that hidden sephirot, Bina, and that one is technically beneath and connects back up to Keter. And so I, I think that there is a, I don't want to say a deeper mystery. I'd rather say a deeper understanding to be grasped here. I remember when I was younger, there was this argument about, and in fact, there's still today this argument about whether or not people should go to college, for example. And so which is more important, wisdom or knowledge? I don't think we can put one above the other because we can be wise, but without knowledge, we don't know enough. We can make decisions. We can get through life. Don't get me wrong. But wisdom with knowledge is always going to be better. And the same, we can have all kinds of knowledge, but without the wisdom to know what to do with it, we're kind of stuck. The knowledge will be helpful. There's many things we can do with that knowledge, but combining with the wisdom unlocks unlimited potential. So I want to start off by talking a little bit about traditional Kabbalah. And once again, my weekly reminder that I am not a... Jewish Kabbalah master. I am an armchair theologian that is trying to understand the revelations the Lord has given me in hopes to spark conversation about these topics within the Latter-day Saint movement because I do believe that these things are relevant to us as Mormons, as Latter-day Saints. So I want to start off by reminding you that in traditional Kabbalah, when we look at the tree of life, we're looking at the emanations of God. And I want to point out that that is not incorrect. There's nothing wrong with that. That is an accurate statement. In Mormon Kabbalah, it seems the Lord is telling us to flip the script, so to speak, because we are created in God's image. And so rather than merely looking at these as the emanations of God, we're also looking at at them as the divine aspects of ourselves as human beings, as the creation of God. And so with that, I want to start off by looking just a, a brief glance or overview of traditional Kabbalah to see how, I'm going to say Jewish Kabbalah mostly, really, because, you know, that's the one I'm focusing on here. But just a more traditional idea of these things as the emanations of God and then I want to flip over and look at these sephirots as God, the light of God, coming or shining through us to remind us of our divine heritage. 
So let's start off by looking at the word itself. Hakma, it's it's a word used in the Bible well over a hundred times. I think it's used like some hundred and fifty times. And it's generally translated as wisdom. If we look at I'm using uh, Strong's Bible concordance here. It is a feminine noun, and it is the top, it is it rests at the top of the feminine pillar of the tree of life. And the translations in English given by this concordance are skill, wisdom, or wits. And I find it interesting that one of the times this is used is in the construction of the temple, the temple tools, and this is in Exodus, and the priestly clothing. It's with the spirit of wisdom that these things are made. And I think that that is very clearly referring to the idea that it was through the Holy Spirit that these artisans were directed and guided to make these sacred things. Wisdom is, of course, mentioned a number of times in Psalms and Proverbs. And I do believe that these are hints to the divine feminine in the Bible. We know that the ancient scribes tried to scrub any references to the divine feminine or heavenly mother out, but I think wisdom is another one of those little hints reminding us of her reality. The idea that wisdom existed before the creation and acted as an agent of God's creation is pretty well defined in the Bible. Uh, there's a scripture in Proverbs 8, 22 through 31, and I'm not going to read it to you. You can check it out. And that seems to be very clear to me, referring to the pre-mortal creation, the pre-mortal existence, and, and wisdom's role in it, and the idea that, that was this wisdom dwelt with God in some way. In the wisdom of Solomon, which is in the Apocrypha, in chapter 7, starting in verse 24, it says, For wisdom is more moving than any motion. She passes and goes through all things by reason of her pureness. She is the breath of the power of God and a pure influence flowing from the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, can no defiled thing fall into her. For she is the brightness of the everlasting light, the unspotted mirror of the power of God and the image of his goodness. And being one, she can do all things. And remaining in herself, she makes all things new. And in all ages, entering into the holy souls, she makes them friends of God and prophets. For God loves none but they that dwell with wisdom. Now you can go and read this. This, this particular passage of scripture is in the Apocrypha. And I think it's very clearly talking about the divine feminine, and also this sephirot within the tree of life, the oneness of God, the presence of God. And in one perspective, it also seems to be describing the Holy Spirit. So what is this? Well, this is the Shekinah. The Shekinah is the presence of God, and it's also the congregation when filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want to get into the Shekinah too much here because I don't like really turning these sephirots into gods, so to speak, but I do believe that they represent various aspects of the divine. And so it's very clear to me that this particular sephirot represents the divine feminine. And so when we flip this, we need to recognize that it's going to be representing the divine feminine within ourselves, because we all are masculine and feminine doesn't matter if we're born male, female, non-binary, if we're cisgender or transgender. At the end of the day, we all have male and female inside of us because these represent the male, the desire to bestow, and the female, the will to receive. And maybe I'm wrong here, but I have never run into anyone in my entire life that has zero desire to either give or receive. This is something intrinsic to human nature and therefore it's intrinsic to our divine nature and our divine attributes so hakma then is in traditional kabbalah the first power of the conscious intellect that is the creation because the first three sephirot exist before the creation and then the 
other seven are the days of creation. And that's not merely in traditional Kabbalah. It appears to be set up based on the revelations I've received the same way in Mormon Kabbalah. Hakma is associated in the soul with the power of intuition or insight. So when we, we realize something, like have that aha moment, that is wisdom. That is Hakma. I think that makes, that makes sense. It also implies this idea or ability to deeply examine or connect with some philosophical or abstract point of reality or concepts and uncovering truth on, I guess, a philosophical level, we could say. And we understand that truth is the very beginning of the creation process. What is the first truth that we receive? The wisdom and the knowledge of the reality of God, or at least the wisdom to know that God exists, even if we don't have a true knowledge yet. And I think that may be why wisdom, even though they're both second and third, might be coming first here on this list. In traditional Kabbalah, Hakma also represents a sense of fear, if you will, because it gives us a boundary to know where our limits are. And so rather than saying fear, I would rather say respect. We know to respect the Lord, to respect our boundaries, and not to run faster than we are able, not to walk further than we can, to paraphrase Messiah there. And another way that some Kabbalists have looked at this is to break Hakma into two words, Hash and Ma, potential and what is. So Hakma, wisdom, also represents our divine potential. And that seems to be a very clear bridge to me between traditional Kabbalah and Mormon Kabbalah. And the final thing I'd like to say about traditional Kabbalah is the idea in the Zohar that Hakma is a point, a pre-mortal point, if you will, a pre-creation point that shines from the will of God and therefore becomes the starting point of the creation. So this would be the light separating from the darkness, the wisdom separating from the lack of wisdom. Now, I could go into some various things into Gnosticism and more into these ideas of traditional Kabbalah, but I feel like I'm just being a dictionary right now. I'd really like to dive into this revelation, so let's go ahead and move forward. And with this very basic understanding that I've just laid out here of Hakma representing the divine feminine and being wisdom and in some way representing the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit, or the the presence of God. Let's look at the book of Remembrance, starting in verse 5, and see how this corresponds or relates to us. The second and third is Hakma, wisdom, the beginning of the path before the creation. So that's verse 5. So this does seem to indicate that this is where we start, because in verse 9 it says that Da'at is the truth of the way before the creation. So we have another piece of the puzzle here pointing to this idea that the path starts with wisdom. And what is wisdom? It is for us to seek God. In Proverbs 1.7, it says, it says fear, but I'm going to change it to respect. The respect of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. A nod right there to the divine masculine and divine feminine working together hand in hand. And I think it's very important that we understand that this wisdom comes from something before this creation, something outside of this creation. All truth exists independently outside of this world. So when we're seeking true wisdom and true knowledge, by the same token here, what we're really seeking is God. We're seeking the restoration of the things as they were and as they were always meant to be and as they always will be once the resurrection is completed. In verse 6 it says, And only by wisdom may knowledge be understood, for the beginning of wisdom is the fear, and again, I will say, the respect of the Lord, which sounds very familiar to me 
to Proverbs 1-7, which I just read. So we can have all the scriptures, we can have all of these amazing things memorized and know so much. But wisdom, I think, is that key that unlocks that knowledge. And we can only receive this not by being wise in or of ourselves or of this world, but rather through the Holy Spirit, by knowing where our boundaries are, respecting God and understanding where the Lord has drawn lines. Now, I have several examples that have popped into my head after saying that. And I, I want to bring up Nephi slaying Laban. This is a very controversial topic. And the things I'm going to mention about this are going to be very controversial. One of the things that I love about the Book of Mormon is the fact that it teaches us not to blindly follow prophets. There's a part in Alma where Captain Moroni says, I know the Holy Spirit's told me that these things are happening. And then in the next chapter, well, in the I should say in the next chapter in the, I'm going from memory here, I apologize. In the next chapter in the OPV, the head of that city says, well, you're kind of right, but it's not me, it's the people. And so one question that some people ask is, he's prophesying in the name of the Lord. Why is he wrong? Well, I, I think that the Lord can give us knowledge and wisdom and we as human beings can misinterpret it. We need to understand where the line is drawn in our understanding of things and in God's understanding of things. Are we doing things with respect to the Lord? So let's take this back to Nephi. What does this have to do with Nephi? Well, imagine you're young your dad's taken you out of away from everything you know, out in the middle of nowhere. And now he sent you in to go before this powerful person and demand some brass plates that reading the scriptures, reading in the text, I get the impression that they weren't supposed to know about these plates. And I feel like the reason why Laban is trying to kill them is because they know about the secret of the existence of these plates. They're, they're supposed to be kept hidden. And then Nephi comes in and slays Laban, takes his clothes, and gets the plates, and comes back as a hero, at least in his own eyes, because this is his story being told by him. I want to look at this from an outside perspective. How would I tell this story? You have, again, a young boy who's afraid, He's large in stature. He's a big guy. Probably doesn't realize or recognize his own strength. And he's in a life or death situation. The man who has instructed other people to slay him and his brothers is drunk before him. And so he kills him. He murders him. I am going to use the word murder here. He killed a man not in self-defense. And I know that there's a number of Latter-day Saint armchair theologians and scholars who make excuses and say, well, according to the Torah, he had every right to do so. And maybe he did. But in the mercy of Jesus Christ, he did not. And seeing that this is a book written for the modern day, I think that this scripture was given to serve a warning to us. I think that what happened is Nephi had this experience and he had to deal with the guilt of knowing he killed someone. He goes back and his father makes a comment that now we won't dwindle in unbelief because we have these plates of brass. But let's be real. Lehi was a prophet. If the scriptures are that important, he could have received a revelation. And if Nephi was also a prophet, he could have helped. And through the Leahona or an Urim and Thummim or some sort of seer stone, they could have been given all of the light and knowledge found in the plates of brass. And as someone who claims to have translated the plates of brass, I'm going to tell you, the way I did it was by going into a cave in vision. So I don't need them physically too. They could still be hanging out in Jerusalem and it wouldn't really matter. That would be fine. I, I could still have access to them because I don't have them physically. Just like Joseph Smith, he may have had the gold plates sitting physically near him, but whether he put a rock in a hat or an urim and thumb in a hat, doesn't really matter. 
we still know he put something in a hat and didn't actually uncover the plates. He didn't read them the way you or I would read a book or even Joseph Smith. He didn't read them the way that he, Joseph Smith, would normally read a book. I don't know why I have to make it about us. As Joseph Smith read books the same way we do. But you get my point. Wisdom was going back, knowing that the Lord had created a plan for him to succeed. But Nephi didn't know or realize his or recognize his limitations. Yes, maybe if he would not have slayed Laban, Laban would have realized what had happened and sent people after them. At the same time, though, if everything played out the same way, I'm fairly convinced that rather than worrying about the sons of Lehi, I think the missing servant, Zoram, was the most likely suspect of the people of Laban as to who killed Laban and took his stuff because not realizing who he was with, he helped Nephi get the plates of brass. And so they probably assume that he's the one who killed Laban and took his sword, which has valuable jewels in it, right? So did Nephi have to kill Laban? No. Zoram most likely would have taken the blame either way. And if everything played out the same, except that Nephi knocked Laban unconscious or kept him tied up since he was already unconscious, they probably would have just presumed that Zoram was the bad guy regardless. And since he went with them out into the wilderness, he's the one that would have taken all of the blame. And Laban could have lived, in my opinion. Now, I could be wrong. I'm giving you my two cents. I wasn't there. I am judging Nephi here, but I'm judging him because if I'm ever in that situation, I want to choose life and not taking a life. And I think that we need to look at the scriptures more critically and we need wisdom to do that. And I've talked to so many people who try to use that as an excuse for things that they do. Well, remember that Nephi was told to kill Laban. And so I'm justified in this thing that I'm doing. No, you're not. I don't believe that Nephi was justified in murdering Laban. I think he made an excuse. And I think the reason why that's in the Book of Mormon is for us to have the knowledge that it happened and the wisdom to understand it wasn't the right thing or the only solution. So brothers and sisters, it is imperative that we respect the Lord and know where our boundaries are. And for me, that is a big part of wisdom. So that's why to me, it's only by wisdom that knowledge can be understood. I can memorize what happened between Nephi and Laban, but I can only understand it through wisdom. And true wisdom isn't using this knowledge to help me in my own egoism. Rather, true wisdom is respecting the Lord and seeking the more peaceful and merciful path. And I want to stick with this example of Nephi for a moment and, and take this to a Kabbalistic conclusion. In Kabbalah, the scriptures are us. And I've talked about this before, this idea that I am Nephi. I was born of goodly parents and therefore I was taught to read and write and, and so on and so forth. But I'm also Laman and Lemuel. There are parts of me that have doubts. I'm a human being. And so I do think that there is a Kabbalistic view of the scripture. And again, this goes back to the wisdom. How can we use this to be wise? I am Nephi. I There's a righteous part of me that's been sent forth to get the scriptures. And Laban doesn't want me to have them. There's a Laban inside of me that's a wicked desire. It wants to take all of Lehi's goods and murder the righteous desires. And so we, the Nephi inside of us, does need to slay Laban. But that's a capitalistic point of view. That's, that's saying that I need to rid myself of egoism and move towards Christ-like altruism. And so there are other reasons for these types of stories in the scriptures. They're not there to teach us that we need to kill other people. They're there to remind us that we have wicked desires inside of us that need to be destroyed. And this can only happen through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And the Savior, through the atonement, purges them from us as we grow in that grace and embrace the righteous desires inside of ourselves. 
I've talked about this in other podcasts, not in Nephi specifically, but you know, Noah and the Flood and things like this, and I will talk about it again in the future. But I just want to go over this concept with you quickly to, to wrap up my thought here, because this is a part of wisdom. This is Hakma. And so if we're going to be wise, we need to liken the scriptures into ourselves as in our desires and not use them egotistically to make excuses for wicked things that we've done or we want to do. I, I do hope this helps you understand this Sephirot of wisdom because it does come from both sides, the emanation of God to us and the emanation of God from us. So in verse 7, it says, Wisdom is the right eye. What does that mean, the right eye? For wisdom came from the Torah, the treasure of heaven. Now, I want to point out here something interesting. In the visions and parables of Zenos, in vision, Zenos mentions this idea that the Torah, or the sapphire tablet, if you will, is from the masculine. And then there's this emerald tablet, which I presume is... Wisdom, I, I believe, is tied to temple rituals, is tied to the divine feminine. And yet this says that wisdom came from the Torah, the treasure of heaven. That would be the sapphire tablet. Is that a contradiction? No. Because once again, this is saying that they have to work together. The wisdom and knowledge the masculine and the feminine, they have to work together. They have to be one. You can't have one without the other. So what is this wisdom in the right eye? What does that mean? In ancient Hebrew, there was this idea that the right side had some sort of prominence. There's this idea of people who are in honor sitting on the right side of someone. In 1 Kings 2.19, Solomon places the seat of honor for his mother, the queen, on his right side. There was this idea that the right eye was incredibly important and maybe the most vital part of the body. In Zechariah eleven seventeen, there's a warning that says, Woe unto the idle shepherd that leaves the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. In one sense, the right eye can represent seeking the good in others. The right eye can represent affection and empathy. In traditional Kabbalah, there's this idea that the right eye possesses five states of kindness. But I want to look at this from a different perspective. You ever notice how when you cover up one of your eyes, your perspective changes? I think that one of the reasons why the Lord is using the eyes here for knowledge and wisdom goes back to the idea that we need both. If I cover up my left eye and only see out of my right, I'm completely blind on one side of my body. But with both of my eyes uncovered, I can view the world. I have better perception. And then going back to Keter for just a moment and seeing that as our third eye, being able to see now in the physical and spiritual realm, our perspective is completely open and we can truly see. What is greater than a prophet according to the Book of Mormon? A seer. How does a seer see? With eyes. The right eye, the left eye, and the spiritual so-called third eye. I think it's important for us to remember that the Lord wants us to get to know him so that we can better understand ourselves. And I think this idea of the right eye draws back to the understanding that there isn't any one thing alone that will bring us to the Lord or help us understand ourselves better. It's a variety of different things all coming together. So wisdom is our right eye. It is us seeking the wisdom of the things of the Lord. And this, this chapter explains to us how to do that through respect of God and recognizing that it comes from the Torah. Torah means instructions. So it's not merely the scriptures. It's the instructions coming from the Lord. So it would also be the Holy Spirit talking to us 
personal revelation. And this Torah, these instructions, these are the treasures of heaven. And these are the things that are reaching to us through the veil from the pre-mortal or the eternal realm into the, the infinite realm here into this finite world, into us as finite beings, to remind us of our true infinite nature. Number eight, it says that Raphael, who is Raziel, is its herald. Not her herald, its herald. So this is still an emanation. And it says that Raphael walked the earth as Melchizedek until I took him. Now, I'm not going to go into a big thing about who Melchizedek is. I will talk a little bit about who the three, these three are. But I, I again, I said this last week. I'm going to say it again this week. I think that these names are important because they're going to tell us something about ourselves and our divine nature, along with the things connected to this right eye of wisdom. So with that, let's start with Raphael. Who is Raphael? Is Raphael mentioned in the scriptures? He's only mentioned once in the Brighamite canon, and that's in the Doctrine and Covenants when Joseph Smith brings him up. And I believe that's the same in Community of Christ and most Latter-day Saint denominations. But one thing that, that I and others have noticed is the reality that Raphael keeps popping up quite a bit recently. I know of at least three people, including myself, who claim to have been ordained by Raphael. So he is not familiar to the Latter-day Saint movement, but he's not a stranger either. So who then is Raphael? His name means God has healed. He is seen as an archangel in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. He's mentioned in the book of Tobit, which is in the Apocrypha, and in First Enoch. Now the fact that his name means to heal. I think that that is very deep because wisdom heals us from sin. It's through wisdom that we first come to recognize the existence of God. And in that sense, we begin to be spiritually healed or we are spiritually healed if we choose Christ, if we choose to follow God in that moment. So then, who is Raziel? Raziel, the name, means God is my mystery. He is mentioned in Kabbalistic texts, Kabbalistic scriptures, revelations, including the ones that I have received, so Jewish and Mormon Kabbalah. Another name for him is Galadzar, which means revealer of the rock. It is believed that the purpose of Raziel is, is to expound upon the Torah and in both Jewish and and Mormon Kabbalah, it is Raphael or Raziel that teaches Adam and Eve when they leave the Garden of Eden so that they can find their way back home to the Lord. So again, we have these ideas tied to wisdom, the idea of healing. And I would say that that is spiritual and physical. And now here we have this idea of understanding the mysteries of God. Well, isn't that wisdom? Lastly, we have Melchizedek, and Melchizedek is a bit of a mystery in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and there's, I can't even get into all of the different theological, mystical, and different ideas of Melchizedek, but because this is a Mormon podcast, a Latter-day Saint-based podcast, I am going to talk about Melchizedek in our movement, and it's important to understand that According to the revelations of Joseph Smith, Melchizedek was not only the king of Salem, he was also someone who, like Enoch, again in Latter-day Saints tradition, was translated along with his city. Now, I get the impression that Enoch's city was large and Melchizedek's was smaller. In the Bible, we know that he was the king of Salem and the priest of El Elyon, which is a name for God translates to the Most High God, and he's first mentioned in Genesis 14, and it's very similar in First Moses. But in First Moses, it expands the story, and he gives the temple rituals, the temple rites, to Abraham and Sarah, and they then pass it down. He's the one who gives them their new names of Abraham and Sarah, from Abram to Abraham and Sariah to Sarah, and the 
teachings that later become Judaism really originated from Melchizedek teaching them to Abraham. So Moses is restoring everything that Melchizedek gave to Abraham and Sarah in the first place. So what does the name mean? That that's, seems to be important in this context. And it translates to the king of righteousness. While Jesus is the prince of peace, this is saying that Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. And I think that's why Jesus is proclaimed to be Melchizedek in the New Testament. Another way of translating this would be to say, my king is righteousness or my Lord is righteousness. And so I think that putting these names together tells us quite a bit about ourselves and our journey. This idea of wisdom being the healer, wisdom being the revelations of God. And what is that revelation in the flesh? What is that revelation to us? That our king is righteousness. That to me is what these names are saying. That's the hidden secret mystery, if you will, of, of this final verse that we're going to go over today. So we're going to stop here for this week. And I hope that you're finding this beneficial. I'm hoping that you are able to understand God, the nature of God, a little bit better. In this instance, in this podcast, the wisdom of God, not merely as it flows into us through the veil, but also as it emanates from us as we are the light of Christ. If we truly are the light of Christ and that light is shining from us, that means that this wisdom is shining from us also. And we share in that divine nature with God. And that harkens right back to what Paul said, that we are joint heirs with Christ through his redemption and resurrection and atonement. And I really think that the key point in all of this is a reminder of how important we are to God, how special we are, and that the Lord sees us. And through these right and left eyes, knowledge and wisdom, I genuinely believe that we can see the Lord's works in action and we can see, we can stand in the presence of the Lord. So until next week, shalom and God bless.